So Web3 startups can move very quickly. They have few limitations. They ship and many times they win very quickly. They win market share very quickly because they've shipped a better product or they shipped a good product. And so it's a pleasure to work with many of our DeFi, GameFi and other users because they ship on production, they make something valuable, they gain user usership, they gain a community, they give us great feedback to help improve the Chainlink network to facilitate even better uh, data, even better cross chain. And also they're so far along in building things that they're now actually able to use multiple Chainlink networks. So they're able to use a proof of reserve network, a price network, the CCIP bridge, um, an automation network. So now we're actually seeing them compose their application out of a few contracts and a few different Oracle networks because they see the usefulness of Oracle networks because they're trying to build more advanced things. So I'm a huge fan of all the DeFi, GameFi teams in our industry. They're constantly pushing the limit. They're constantly inventing new things. They're constantly redefining our industry into something new like the way that DeFi did. And really, we've always been super proud of being part of that in some small way. Um, for example, with Aave and, and others, that the idea that we could launch with them and that we could help make them successful and that we can make other protocols successful and, and help bring DeFi to the state that it is today is something that we're just um, personally, I'm personally very proud of and everyone in, our, in the Chainlink Labs organization and everyone in the Chainlink community is very proud of. So working with startups, DeFi, GameFi and others has always been a real pleasure for me. And it's also a group of people that I understand because I myself um, have gone through that and, I, and I'm building a technology infrastructure startup, but also, you know, understand what it takes to build to build what they built. So big, big fan of, of, of those people and excited to work with them for many years and try to set them up for success as much as possible. On the institutional side, you have people who have huge amounts of value in their system. And what I've learned is that because there's so much value in their system, they have to be more conservative. They have to be less risk tolerant because when you don't have any value in your system, launching a system that does something not exactly the right way is not a big deal because you already don't have much to lose. And you know that's what some people do in our industry. They launch in secure systems. They don't get the relevant audits. They have failures and then they deal with the failures. And you know I don't personally think that's the right approach. But um, when you're a bigger institution, when you have huge amounts of value, the reality is you can take cer certain risks that people with no value in their system can take. So that leads the institutions to move slower, which I obviously don't like. Um, I'm very negative on um, how long it takes to move new technologies into institutions. But the benefit of moving them into institutions is that once institutions adopt a technology, such as banks or asset managers, once they adopt a technology, they put so much value on that technology that that conservative nature works in your favor, right? Because just like it's, it's a risk for them to get off COBOL servers, and it's a risk for them to get off any number of other technologies, it then becomes a risk for them to get off your technology because your technology is what powers their value. It's what secures their systems. It's what their employees understand. It's what they have processes around. And so it's kind of a double-edged sword. And, and, and the question really to a degree is, do you have the patience? Do you have the right product? Do you have the runway? Do you have the time to properly integrate into all of these large institutions that have large amounts of value to prove that you're secure, to go through the process of proving that? To, to, to prove the, you know, the value of all the features in a gradual basis to literally tens of people in different departments. And if you do, and you do integrate with them, and you do become the system that they use to transact between each other and, and within their own internal systems and to, to move data into and out of contracts, well, then you've become an important critical part of that world. What, what we're doing is we're working with both groups because I feel that both groups are fundamentally trying to do the same thing. They're trying to create valuable transactions. The, the DeFi public blockchain people have one group of people that have one set of requirements for what a valuable transaction is. And that's defined by personal control of assets, decentralization, and various new types of asset classes, such as uh, you know, flat coins are very interesting and algorithmic stable coins. So really advanced stuff. So there's kind of a community of people that find these, these, these things interesting. And obviously they're, they're interested in, in yield and defined lending and so on. And then you have a different set of requirements in the institutional world um, around security and scalability and a few others. But realistically, I strongly believe that once the legal barrier 
between the startup world and the private bank world goes down, you will have both of these worlds connect into one big internet of contracts. And so if the public blockchain world runs off of Chainlink data, uses Chainlink automation in, in most of their critical uh, transactions, utilizes cross-chain bridging to communicate between different chains, and then you have the private bank chain world communicating between themselves using CCIP, using that same data, using that same automation, and this wall, this barrier separating them disappears, then I think it's actually a very, very natural, almost a seamless experience for both of those groups to transact. And so that's the thing that if you try to build that later on, when, when everyone was ready to transact, it would actually be too much to build and it'd be really confusing, frankly. But if you can get both of these groups on the same set of standards, and then you can get them both prepared to transact with each other, and then once they're able and willing to transact with each other, that's, I think, the really big third step, right? So if the first step was getting public chain DeFi, which we're still doing, and we're going to support them to the best degree we can. And then the second step is getting private blockchains in banks and asset managers in the CSD world to all connect using CCIP and using the various other chain link services. Then the third step is getting those two worlds to interact with each other over the chain link protocol, over CCIP, over the same data standards, over the same automation standards, and then you can have a single internet of contracts running on Chainlink and the Chainlink framework and the Chainlink network, irrespective of what chain anyone is running on. So in that world, everyone can have their own chain in whatever technology they want, and they can still work with each other, communicate with each other on chain, interact with each other's financial products because they all use the same reliable data, and really create a next generation internet of contracts that powers the global financial system using blockchains as the fundamental underlying infrastructure.